Well, folks, this week is end of times, and indeed, it's the end of our Twisted series. Now, if it's the end of times, we here at Twisted want to be sure you're ready for the ultimate final exam. So here's a quick review of what we learned in the series. We all experience scripture in many different ways. First off, we started with, we found Jesus at a bus stop in West Hollywood. Hmm? We learned Reverend Andrea needs to leave ironing to the elbows, <laughs> amen. <laughs> Reverend Michael Diaz brilliantly explained, bless your heart, <laughs> bless his heart. Hmm. The blessings of the Lord makes one rich, and he or she adds no sorrow with it, which led us to, I got me plane. <laughs> and finally, a group is building a roller coaster based on the 10 plagues of Egypt. Uh, it's been a series, hasn't it? You know, we find blessings in scripture in many different ways. I hope you have enjoyed our series and found humor and lightness through it. You see, humor is actually needed for healing to begin, and grace often starts with a bit of laughter. You're welcome. I'll see you at the 49th, unless rapture happens, I'm Jerry Callum, and for the last time, back to the live show. Church, I think we need some prayer. Let's pray together. <laughs> God, how grateful we are that you have invited us into this place. I'm grateful that we get to stand on holy ground this day with you, living through us, opening us to all that is sacred, all that is holy, all that is blessed, and all that would lead us toward truth. So help us this day, God, as we come to open our hearts and our minds one more time to find the moving of your Holy Spirit living and breathing within us, causing us to live in the ways of Jesus. Open us, God, so that the truth might set us free, free to love and free to live. And now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the Christ in whom we pray. Amen. So indeed, today we do close out this series of Twisted, an opportunity for us to take our scriptures seriously, if not literally, an opportunity for us to reclaim the sacred, to reclaim the sacred text that we get to open week in and week out an opportunity for us to perhaps reclaim the Bible as our friend and not as our enemy, knowing that for so many of us, the Bible has been used as a weapon against so many. And an opportunity for us to get real with some of the problems and the tactics that have been used throughout the Christian church to separate people out rather than to bring people together an opportunity for us perhaps to think about some of the ways in which our sacred text has been used to divide people and has been used to justify many of the systems of oppression that we have lived into and that many of us still live under. And we've used this opportunity perhaps to give us fresh eyes, new eyes on a scripture that we can embrace in our own experience of life. So we've looked at the ways in which our Scripture has been used to justify slavery, to the oppression of women, the ways in which LGBTQI people have been hit over the head by those six clobber passages. We looked at nationalism versus patriotism. And today we come to the end of this series of sermons to talk about end times. And as Jerry said in his little video, we have learned so much and you have blessed me in abundance. Yes, I got my plane. <laughs> I got my Lamborghini. <laughs> I got another Lamborghini. <laughs> and nearly caused a divorce, a divorce by two women building me a new Lamborghini. <laughs> Prosperity preaching at its best. <laughs> End times. 
I think the truth is that many of us have lived under a system of theology, a system of theology that teaches us about end times. It talks about how at the end of time, when this earth comes to an end, that there will be a separation of those who believe and those who don't believe. That we have, many of us, lived under that kind of a system from a place of fear, from a place of the theology that encourages us to think about the reward that we will get in heaven. And that many of us spend much of our time concerned about what will happen in the hereafter, concerned about whether we are going to get to heaven or whether we are going to end up in the pits of hell. And the pits of hell where there is fire and the gnashing of the teeth. A place that many of us want to avoid at all costs. And a system of theology, a system of oppression, a system of biblical understanding that has caused many of us to perhaps have false motives when it comes to our acknowledgement of who Jesus is. When I was candidating for this particular position here at Cathedral of Hope and I was reading the profile, it said that Cathedral of Hope had some two different distinct groups of people within its congregation. There were those who came from the Roman Catholic tradition. How many of us come from the Roman Catholic tradition? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good number. And then there's a whole other group of people who come from the more evangelical, conservative, perhaps even Southern Baptist tradition. How many of us come from those traditions? Oh, look at the 11 o'clock. <laughs> uh, there's another group, of course, who don't come from any tradition, and the Cathedral of Hope is their main tradition or their first tradition. And then there is a whole other group who come from the Cathopaptist Pentecostals a hybrid of all of those traditions coming together into this place we call hope. And as part of that understanding coming from both the Catholic and from the more evangelical traditions, we understand that both of those traditions have at least one thing in common, and that they have used guilt and shame to drive people to church. For the Roman Catholics, it is avoiding purgatory and for the evangelicals, it's about having more concern about their entrance into heaven than about anything else. In fact, when we think about just our entrance into heaven and knowing that Christ will come at any time, any moment Christ will burst through the clouds, you better be ready. And you better not have any unconfessed sin or you better not have some things in your life that you're concerned about because on that day, on that moment... There will be a separation, just like the sheep and the goats. There will be a separation of those who will get into heaven, and then there's those who will get left behind. And if you've ever read any of those books in the Left Behind series, they are scary enough to drive you into the place of wanting to get into heaven as quickly as possible. Indeed, when you are just concerned about getting into heaven, there is no need to be concerned about the systems of oppression in our world. There's no need to worry about global warming. There's no need to worry about who's, been, who's homeless or who has got a home full because at any moment God will enter the world and break through and a new heaven and a new earth will be created. And so we spend much of our time, perhaps even those of us in this place this morning, spend much of our time thinking about a future reward and thinking about what heaven will look like. In my time of being a chaplain, I remember there were many folks who wanted to talk about what heaven would look like. I would often tell, quote from the Scriptures when Jesus said, in, in God's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. And Jesus, the Thomas, the one who would doubt, would say, but how do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I would quote those many mansions and would invite people to talk to me about what they thought heaven looked like. And many folks had never actually thought about what heaven looked like. They just had an image that heaven was this future reward that we would get when we would die called eternal life. Perhaps it was a cloud where we would bounce around for the rest of eternity playing our little harps. 
And I would often say, I believe that heaven is only what you can imagine it to be. And specifically in the AIDS pandemic years, I remember sharing specifically with gay men who were dying because they had lost their faith or had their faith stolen from them and were still concerned about heaven. And I would say that perhaps heaven is propping up a bar at JR's <laughs> and never getting drunk. Whatever heaven was perceived to be, perhaps that is all that we can imagine. And then Jesus says, I create a new heaven and a new earth. There's something we need to understand about our sacred text is that those disciples, as they encountered Jesus, as they heard Jesus, this Jesus that they listened to said that some of the folks who were listening to these words would never die before Jesus came again. And those early disciples spent much of their time running around helping to convert people because they believed that before they would die, heaven would come, that somehow God would come through the clouds, Jesus would return, and it would all be over. And here we are 2,000 years later still waiting, still waiting for the second coming, still waiting for Jesus to return and the church has used much of its motivation to control people in order that they might get into heaven, in order that they might have some future reward. And many of us spend a lot of our times thinking about what heaven will look like. We're a long time dead. And what will heaven look like? The motivation for getting our way into heaven is perhaps for many of us seen through the wrong lens. Instead of using fear as the motivator for us to get into heaven, in, instead of using fear or, or guilt or shame or, or whatever it is that has motivated us to refine our reward in heaven, if that has been motivated by fear and guilt and shame, it's time for us to untwist our scriptures and to understand that the only motivation that we should have for any future glory is to know that we have been called to create heaven here on earth. That the only motivation that we should be called to in our experience of the faithful, in the experience of God who is with us, that Emmanuel that we speak of in Advent is a God who is present now. And perhaps the second coming that we look for to the clouds is actually already here. That perhaps the second coming of Christ is sat right next to you this morning. Perhaps the manifestation of Jesus in the world today is not some future reward, but rather a place that is called, as Jesus would say in the prayer of Jesus, I've come that you might have heaven here on earth. May my heaven look more like your earth. And that perhaps our motivation for being in church this morning is not about trying to find a reward to get into heaven. For some of us edging our bets, if I could just be good for today... If I can just be good for this next hour, or even just good for the next 20 minutes, and then I can run to the bathroom and come back again, especially for those of us over 50. <laughs> you know who we are. If we could just get through this next hour, if we could just get through this next moment, if I could just get through this church service, run to my car and get out of here, and then I can return to where I was. If that is my motivation for being here this morning, perhaps it is time for us to look through a different lens. And perhaps our motivation for being here today is because of God's great love for us. Perhaps our motivation for being in this place this morning for worship is, is not about trying to get into heaven, but is in a response to the gratitude that we have to a God who has deep love for us who sees us just as we are, who sees us intently and beautiful and perfect. Perhaps our motivation for being in worship is, is not about what comes next, but what we are called to do now. Perhaps our motivation for being in this place this morning is so that we might be inspired, so that we might continue to do the good things that God has already displayed in our lives. 
And if our truth is that we have been called to make this earth more like God's heaven, perhaps the heaven that we need to dream of is a heaven where Jesus has been embodied in each and every one of us and calls us as the hands and feet of Christ. Not some future reward, but a reward that is made manifest in us this day, this moment, so that we might make this a better place for everyone. Perhaps that's our motivation. And our worship is a direct response to what God is doing. Not a God who just has to bless us all the time. You know, when we believe in a God who, who only shows up when we are being blessed, we are missing out on the fullness of God who just dwells with us in all circumstances. And perhaps our motivation is to be reminded of God's goodness amongst all of the hatred of the world. Perhaps our response to God is out of a sense of gratitude that we might be the peacemakers, the love creators, the co-creators with God. And our return to worship week in and week out, yes, I said it again, week in and week out, our response of discipline to worship is about giving us hope for tomorrow and hope for a better world. It is that that we call ourselves in as we untwist this idea of heaven and hell. For those of you who perhaps know anything about the Jewish tradition, you'll know that hell was something that they don't even believe in. Hell is a construct of the Christian church. Hell is something that we have used as a motivator to drive people into worship, to drive people to a place of needing something better. Well, I believe we can do better here. I believe we can do better here. I believe that when we manifest the fullness of God in us, the beauty of what God has already dwelt within us, we get to create heaven together. And we get to create it by being creative together. We get to create heaven here on earth when we go about the work of Jesus, when we go about the work of feeding those who are less fortunate than ourselves. We, we get to create heaven here on earth by opening a, one of the first LGBT-focused shelters and transitional housing that we opened here in Dallas just a year ago and opened a second house just this past couple of weeks. Now six people living in our transitional home. We get to create heaven on earth when we resist the hate of our world. And we create heaven here on earth when we opened Hope Day School just six months ago. And many of us would have read the newspapers this week for a lesbian couple in Waco whose child was refused entry into a day school because it didn't meet their religious values. Hope Day School will not only accept their child, but will accept children from opposite gender and same gender parents to coexist together and to create a better world for all of us. Heaven here on earth. If, if we look only to a future reward, we miss out on the blessings of this earth. When we look only to a future reward, we miss out on being change makers and co-creators. We need to untwist our theology. For those of us who have been to seminary, we call that eschatology. And all that that means is that we focus ourselves on what comes next. But I think God is far more concerned with what we do now how we make our lives count, how we transform this earth, how we make it a better place for everyone. And in our series of Twisted, we have conflicted, we have confronted some of those systems of oppression that have driven many of us away from faith rather than to faith. This day, we celebrate the greatness of a heaven that isn't some future place. Not one of us has been there and come back except Jesus. But we are called to create heaven here on earth. 
We are called to bless one another and to love on one another. It is not our turn to tell people when end times will come. You know, others have tried that. How many of us have lived through many periods when we've been told the earth is coming to an end? I remember it in the year 2000 when all the computers were going to explode like Jesus. (laughs) And we keep waiting. And in our waiting, we're called to do something, not to do nothing. And we must call ourselves and the world in which we find ourselves today not to be so concerned with what comes next, whether we're going to be on a fluffy white cloud playing our harp for Jesus for the rest of eternity, but to know that eternity is not something that comes next, it is something that happens now. For many of us, we believe that eternal life is the moment we decide to be different the moment we decide to follow Jesus, the moment we decide to turn our lives around and to live life differently. We may or may not be living in end times. I think the way in which we are treating the earth, we might just be at that place. But nonetheless, whether it's tomorrow or a thousand years from now, The deal is that we do something now. We shape this earth that it might become more like God's heaven. Next week, we'll celebrate our 50th anniversary and so many achievements over the last 50 years. But at the same time, we will ask ourselves, Cathedral of Hope, what do we do now to secure our future? To secure a future for those who need hope just like we did. And who knows, when we celebrate our 100th anniversary, some of us may be up on a cloud watching it, but there'll be others at Hope Day School. And little Keith that was born this week who will sit in our pews and will celebrate all that we have done because we created just a little bit of heaven here on earth. Let's join together. Let's untwist our minds so that we not consider so much about where we're going, but perhaps focus on what we're doing to make this real. God bless you, Cathedral of Hope, and I can't wait till next Sunday. We're going to have a fabulous anniversary. (laughs) God bless you.